consider the design for the inlay itself. And so what I mean by that is the grain and color of the wood is only going to exist within these lines that I have marked out here for my inlay. And as you can see, my particular inlay is very narrow and curvy. So um, a good example of what not to do would be to take a wood like this that has very spread out and prominent banding like this. See these dark lines? On such a small piece with the thin lines that I have here, th this banding is going to be so spread apart within the context of this inlay that you're, you're not going to be able to grasp the bigger picture of this wood. This is a beautiful wood, but if we use this wood for here, you're only going to get one, two, at best three of these very dark lines running through there and one might appear right on this little piece right here um, another might appear right on this um, little arm this long thin piece coming off right here on such a thin piece it's not going to look like a natural part of the wood it's actually going to look like something went wrong like a repair like like this piece broke in the middle another example would be for this maple Maple, again, is a great choice for inlay material for pretty much anything. However, this piece is flat sawn. And not that you can't use flat sawn wood for inlays, you certainly can. But again, in, look at it in the context of the design of your inlay. And this flat sawn wood has these, these dark lines that only appear a couple times throughout this entire piece. So if I were to use this, and if this dark line right here in the maple were to run right down the center of this, it would look like this snapped down the middle and then I glued it back together. It just, it loses, when you, when you don't have the context of the, the entire piece of wood, you, the eye doesn't understand that as um, part of the grain or banding pattern of the wood. Rather, it recognizes it as an irregularity. For a first inlay, I would stay away from really brightly colored woods like paddock, uh, maybe even babinga. Actually, I'm not sure if this is babinga. I think it is. It might, this might even be more paddock. No, I think it's babinga. But regardless, some of these exciting bright woods like purple heart and paddock they often look good before you put them in the wood, but it, they almost look a little cartoonish, those colors, um, unless they're used in the proper context. Say if you're designing an inlay of an animal or some sort of uh, colorful scene and you need these bright colors like a bright red. Do keep in mind though that the, the bright colors and this can be good or bad depending on what you're trying to get out of it, the bright colors do fade over time. So if you have a fresh piece of paddock, you can see this side is fairly fresh. Uh, it, it looks very red. It dulls over time and becomes more of a, an earth tone. Over here on the sand, fresh surface. And you can see how bright red that is, but then how dull and brown it looks on the back. So for an inlay like this, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to allow banding at all on this inlay, I want those lines to be very tight together. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to recognize that as um, a natural pattern in the wood, and it's going to look like a mistake. Um, this would be another example. This is very prominent banding, but it's close enough together that you can tell what's going on. Now, you don't have to have any sort of banding at all. Here are some, these are great woods. Um, Imbuya, I think that's how you pronounce it. An interesting wood that I've been collecting pieces of when I find it. Uh, it, it's very sort of, has sort of a cloud-like and ambiguous appearance, grain-wise. Color-wise, it's a nice sandstone brown. 
So what I'm doing here is rubbing some mineral spirits on the wood, and what that does is that makes the grain and the figure really pop. So I can make my decision based on what it looks like um, after the finish is applied. So I've decided that I'm going to go with the maple. And I'm not going to go with the flat sawn piece of maple that I have here for the reason I mentioned earlier. This piece is quarter sawn to the face so that I have very tight grain lines. They're, they're pretty light, but you can still see them. Um, what you're seeing going across to the side is the figure. That is not the grain. See how the figure moves? This has very tight grain lines, it has great figure, and it's going to pop when I put it into this darker wood. Now this head plate isn't dark like an ebony or like most of the, the darker rose woods or walnut, so I'm going to have to be extra careful with routing out the pocket for this inlay so there aren't a lot of gaps because it's going to be a little harder to fill those gaps and make it look good with a lighter colored wood. Relatively speaking, again, this is more of a medium colored wood. It's not like we're inlaying into maple or spruce. That would be a real challenge. So anyway, that's all the more reason for me to show you the best technique possible because I don't want the mistakes I make to show up in this lighter colored wood. And again, if this is your first inlay, I recommend going with the darkest wood possible for the substrate and the lightest wood possible for the inlay. Now let's remove the strings, the tuning keys, and the nuts so we can get to work on the inlay. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.